Hello, good evening. My name is Peter Bonfito. I'm the director of the art galleries here at Austin Community College. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Artisan Conversation event. This is our, um, our spring event, Artisan Conversation, and it's related to the food, water, uh, shelter, excuse me, food, shelter, water, uh, pro uh, projects by four Texas photographers exhibition. Um, and tonight we are joined with our um, four photographers that we're featuring in this exhibition, Veronica Cardenas, Cindy Elizabeth, Stephanie Dupree Ruth, and Jamie Robertson. So I'm really happy to have all the photographers for this fantastic exhibition um, here in the gallery. So we're doing our uh, session today in the gallery surrounded by the photographs. The exhibition itself, uh, just a little synopsis of it. Food, Shelter, Water is an exhibition featuring four Texas photographers who within their works address themes related to our most basic human needs. Presenting images from Egypt, Latin America, East Texas, the Southern border and Austin, these photographers offer uh, a look into the diverging ways in which we interact with our social and physical environments. Regardless of the hardships we face, we all have experiences that speak to our shared humanity. So that was really the premise um, for the exhibition. And so we were really lucky enough to ask four photographers and they all said yes right away, which was even, we were even more lucky to have. And so we're really excited to be able to, um, to present this event. And so the structure of the, of the event will be, we'll have uh, two sessions. First, we're gonna have uh, Cindy Elizabeth, and Veronica Cardenas and uh, in a conversation and then we'll switch and Stephanie and Jamie will come up to the stage in, um, in a little while. So Cindy Elizabeth right here to my left is a freelance portrait and documentary, documentary photographer living and working in Austin, Texas. She is an alumni of ACC's professional photography program and her work has been featured in major publications such as the New York Times, Bloomberg, Equal Justice Initiative and Vogue. As an Austin native, Cindy is best known for her documentation of East Austin's Black communities during events such as Juneteenth parades and annual car club meetups. Much of her work reflects on themes of social justice while exploring the celebration of everyday life. Veronica Cardenas, also on my left, is a documentary photographer, video and photojournalist based in McAllen, Texas. Their work documents the journeys of migrants and asylum seekers to the U.S. border and major publications, including the Texas Tribune, Reuters, the Wall Street Journal. A Mexican-born immigrant themselves living in the Rio Grande Valley um, has had a tremendous influence on their work. Veronica provides a global provides a global audience with context on migration's effects through intimate stories of identity and well-being. So please welcome our first two guests. Okay, so I'm gonna start the conversation and the way we conceptualize the, the different breaks or the different sessions is to think about um, in some ways looking at these photographs together. So we have the luxury of having them really right behind us and being surrounded by them. But one of the, the common threads that I, I find in your work, or at least this selection of your work, is um, the human form is very prevalent in your in your work. And so I, I kind of want to un, uh, unpack that a little bit as we go through the conversation, but I think it's more important to start the conversation with thinking about the subjects themselves and talking about your relationship with, with the subjects in your photographs. Um, so could you maybe just start, uh, talking about you know how do you interact with the people when you're photographing them yes um thank you for that beautiful welcome and introduction um i tend to approach every image in the same way um especially when i'm dealing with um people and not just things or places but um I love to approach image making um, by building a connection um, and through building trust and from a place of collaboration where it's not just me taking someone's photo. You know, it's I love to think of it as more of a collaborative effort 
um, and that lends to more authentic representation um, and really capturing the truth and the realness of who someone is. Um, so practically what I like to do is um, have conversations with people, um, talk about things that um, interest them, listen to their story and share my story and things that interest me. And that is like, for me, the most important part of documenting people, documenting communities is making that connection. So that is not about me, but it's about who they are. But because you have that, because you're, you're bringing yourself into it. So you're in those photographs to some degree. Do you feel like? Um, I feel that I kind of, I, I will have an idea of what I want, I, what I would like to imagine an image to look like. But as far as how someone wants to be represented, I'll leave that to them. And I'm not going to make that decision for them. Vera, do you want to talk about your subjects as well? Yes. So can everybody hear me here? OK, we're good. Perfect. Uh, so thank you for being here and for the folks that are watching online. Thank you as well. I I think that every time that I can, I when I'm taking a photo or I'm talking to, well, in this case, migrants, I try to think of my sister or my brother, my nephew, my niece, my aunt, my grandma, and and then just think about them. And if they were there, you know, how, how would I be photographing them? Um, sometimes you really don't have much of an option and you just photograph what you see because it's important, because it's news and you, you need to show what's happening. But sometimes there are those moments where you can sit down and talk to them and also see how you can relate to them because we have more things in common than than we think. We're just they just happen to be in this transitional state, you know, for a little while. But that does not represent who they are. This is just a small frag fragment in their lives. Um, so I I just think if I was a migrant, how would I like to be photographed? What what would I be okay with? And if I'm not okay with that, uh, I probably don't take the photo. Yeah. And maybe if you could both talk a little bit about, um, sometimes you know who you're photographing and sometimes you don't, and how does that affect your process? Um, I, you know, Vera, what you were just saying about, you know, kind of yeah. thinking about them as someone that you do know. And that's really, I think, an interesting way that not all of us would approach it. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that too. Like, is there that that difference? I mean, I guess you get to know them, right? After you photograph them too. So there's that interplay. Yeah. Um, yeah, my first thing is always like, okay, how can I connect with this person? I, I've seen, and this is, I don't know, no shade, but I have seen photojournalists in action. I see, I've seen how some people show up and um, and I see what their work looks like as a result of how they show up. Um, and I try to do the opposite of that. <laughs> you, sometimes you can look at images and you can in you can look at an image of that a, photo, a photographer, you know, made of someone and not see that person at all. Not really like be able to connect with the person in the image. And that's because the photographer isn't trying to connect with the person in the image. Um, and so I, something that, some great advice that was given to me from someone who's an instructor here in the photography department, actually Lizzie Chen, um, a few years ago was, um, Let's see, let me, I don't want to misquote her, but she was, she told me, she said, the first thing that I do when I have to, when I'm given an assignment to photograph someone is um, I do not go in with my camera out. Um, I go in 
to meet the person and to talk with the person. And we will chat for 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, if you have that long, <laughs> before I even think about pulling out the camera. And so even when I don't have just time to sit around with someone, um, just little things like that, not going in with my camera out aimed and okay, let's do this and taking the photo. Um, so I feel like that is an approach, like a more humanistic approach to, you know, making images um, as opposed to just, you know, a more technical, I have to take a portrait of this person. So let me just show up and take the portrait and then I'm out. Yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Same, yeah, same thing. Approaching people. Yeah, 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 of course. You you have to first talk to them. Like sometimes I know I can take a portrait maybe in five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. But before I do that, I have to talk to the person, learn a little bit about them. My personality is like I joke around uh, a little bit or if I'm going to be in their home, sometimes it gets really awkward. So for me, naming how awkward it is really helps. Uh, for example, I was photographing this girl and I stayed there like till they were going to go to bed and it was so quiet. And then you hear the clothes move and like, and then, oh, yes, the, I'm in the hallway. Yes, sir. Go ahead. You know, <laughs> See, the, the dad was going to pass by and I said, oh my God, it's, I know this is so uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> but before I started photographing, yeah, I talked to the mom for like two hours. Uh, because I was going to be with them for three days. So I talked to her for like two hours. And in between these photos, I was talking to them and also like joking around and saying like, oh my God, this is so awkward. Or or I would tell them, okay, so they could understand what I was doing. I would tell them, I'm going to be your paparazzi for three days. <laughs> so you just ignore me, you do your thing. And they laugh and they kind of get it. Um but yeah, always, yeah, trying to make that connection. And I always, always, always try to find things in common that we have because we all have plenty of things in common. Um, so that's what I always do, even though ideologically we might be completely against <laughs> each other's beliefs, but we can always find common ground. And that has been very helpful, obviously, <laughs> to make those connections. Sometimes you don't have time to make connections like that. Like when, when it comes to photojournalism or if I'm at a migrant camp and maybe there's 50 people or a hundred people, I will introduce myself first and say, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so, I'm working for this publication. Um, I'm gonna be photographing around. So just wanna let you know. And if you're not okay with photos, let me know. But I might not be aware that you're in the photo. So if you do see me, I mean, you know, you're gonna see me so you just be aware that I'm taking a photo I might not be aware of you but I try to make a mental note that I shouldn't photograph you and and then that's it but I when there's not large groups I do that so I tell everybody introduce myself so, and then I can work so much more comfortably yeah that really pays off and sometimes they'll post for a photo because they think that that's what you want to do so kind of take the photo and then when they when they get distracted because you already have their permission and you already made a little bit of connection then you take the photo yeah, yeah. <laughs> i've had the same similar experiences yeah. <laughs> well it kind of gets me to the ne next i don't feel like i don't want i don't want you guys to feel like i set you up for this but just kind of thinking about the um the subjects but then also what also is really striking in your work is the human form and the composition the, they're really incredible and so that's like the other part of it right it's 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 a it's someone that you're getting to know but then it's also the human form and you're putting them within the frame of the photographs and you do such an amazing job in in compositionally and so like at what point is there a switch it's like you know someone you're talking to them and then you're just like you're taking the photo and you want to make sure you get this absolutely amazing shot of this little boy jumping in the air with his arms out you know at what point do you do you feel like you switch to that at some point when you're photographing could you ask that again in well, a, a different way maybe it's a simple question that i asked in a very complicated way but just thinking about the complicate the composition like the human form is such a powerful um, element in both of your your work mm -hmm. and so um i do want to 
I want to keep the conversation centered on the subject and the relationship and the content, but at the same time, there are these formal qualities to your work. And I just wanted you to talk a little bit about those and how those, how do those things connect or do they, are they really separate where you kind of have to flip switch and be like, okay, now I'm just thinking about the photograph itself. I don't think I ever flip a switch. Um, I think I, I try to do my best to integrate that, uh, the connection along with how I am making the image, how I'm framing the image as well. And Bretto, you spoke to this earlier about like thinking about, you know, what is the most respectful way to document or to make an image of someone. And that's something that I'm, con that's something I'm thinking about, you know, while we're connecting in the beginning while I am taking photos you know in the moment and also I'm doing that um also after you know I'm I'm done with what I you know came to do is like how can I most respectfully and compassionately and artistically um give a dynamic real authentic representation of a person or of an event of um, what's happening in the environment. So I, I don't know that there's ever a separation. And I think the connecting with um, the people you're photographing does a lot of the legwork for making a great image. Um, and the technical part of you know, how you want to frame something or how you might want to pose someone. Um, I feel like it's just still all linked together with that connection because um, I can't think about, I can't just switch it, switch off that connection piece and only think about framing a body or posing a body. Um, because then, you know, once you lose that connection, then it just really does not come through in the image at all. You know, yeah. I think once you make that connection and once you make people feel comfortable enough um, creating with you, um, then that's when you get the, like, the best creativity out of. So I think the, the, the question is about the framing. Yeah. Right. Just. Yeah. And that connection <laughs> yeah. that you have, you know, yeah. but, then, but then do you think about it formally like, like all of your images you know especially the one right behind you there's this these great silhouettes you know mm -hmm. and so or um with uh john carlos there's just this really beautiful way in which he's set in this in the photograph and so how does that is that that is is that a separate process i guess mm -hmm. from understanding the subject and and so her answer is no, and yeah. wonder well, what your answer is. I think I'm not sure if if it's no or yes, but I think that when I photograph, I look for the light. So that's the first thing. I'm maybe not thinking of. I'm not making an interaction. I'll look around. And I see, oh, that's beautiful light. So th I think of that. I talk to the person if if it's possible when I'm working as a photojournalist. And then I start talking to them before I take the photo and whatnot, if possible. Sometimes, I mean, there's the language, could be the language barrier, but then you kind of just let them know you're going to take a photo, I guess. It depends, but I, it depends, it depends. So if I first see it, I'm not thinking about the connection. I'm first thinking of the light, how beautiful it looks, or sometimes um, I think like street photographers, that's how I started like getting more into photographing people through street photography. And so I'll look at a scene and I think, oh, the light is beautiful. This is perfect right here. But you know what? You just need one person to pass by right here. And I'm going to wait for that person to pass by. So I am thinking not about making a connection, but about, you know, the framing. So right. I guess it depends. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think we're going to move on. Uh, Cindy, maybe I'll ask you a question about East Austin. Um, and so I'd just like to hear what does East Austin mean to you? And how do you balance representing it while also providing the world 
with an understanding of its communities? Um, to me, you know, East Austin, East Austin means a lot of things. Um, East Austin is home. Um, it's where um, I was raised. Um, it also means loss at this point in time. Um, it, when I think of East Austin, I think of transition. I think of displacement. Um, I also think of vibrancy. And I also think of resilience. And I think of beauty. Um, so it's, you know, it has a lot of different meanings for me right now. Um, and I want to make sure I'm understanding the second part of your question. Um, are you asking how do I balance being from East Austin as well as representing it in my work or? Yeah, basically. Yeah, basically. And, and is that, I mean, well, that might even be a fair question, mm. you know, in a way, which is. Yeah, no, um, I. The, my documentation of East Austin really started as like a, a way to interrogate my feelings um, around what was happening and feeling unsettled. And so um, picking up the camera was a way for me to like really deal with all of those feelings and seeing, you know, how communities came into East Austin and repurpose so many things in East Austin um, as if no one was there um, really made me even more determined to um, begin documenting the histories, the stories, and the vibrancy of the community in East, the historic community in East Austin um, as a way, it was a way for me to say, I'm still here, we're still here, and um, you know, we should be part of the conversation with what's going on. Could you, just to follow up on that, can you talk specifically about, about these photos and the pool and, and how that, we've talked about that before, but mm -hmm. maybe just talk a little bit about that relationship. Yeah, so this, um, these, the photos that are part of this exhibition came about while I was working on um, a public art installation with the org local org arts organization here in Austin, Forklift Dance Works. Um, they put together um, a performance that was, um, they choreographed with community members, um, with aquatic staff and, and used it as a way to like create art and tell the history of the park and of the area. Um, and so these photographs initially were just me um, wanting to like play around with imagery for um, marketing purposes for the, for um, the event. But um, so the, the youth that are in these images were all their parent, either their parents or their grandparents were part of the performance. And so they were there at the pool um, getting ready for their uh, rehearsals and things. And so um, I, you know, just talked to all of the kids, you know, let them know what I was doing. And uh, I really just let them um, show me how, again, show me how it was that they wanted to be photographed. And so um, once they realized that I wasn't, you know, dictating what they should be doing and where they should be, they just really like were so free and uh, was, you know, one by one, hey, miss, look at this. Hey, miss, look at this. And so it was just such a beautiful, you know, collaboration between me and the kids um, of like me just really capturing them in their element and being like, un, like unrestrained and having the freedom to just jump in the water any kind of way that they want to play around in the water. Any, you know, the lifeguards wasn't messing, wasn't messing with them. You know, they gave us a pass. So like, they were just like, really excited um and so that's how these images came about and you know water and has like a really you know interesting history 
um, with African Americans, you know, going back to the transatlantic slave trade, um, going back all the way back then, and then, you know, um, post-slavery, um, Black people in many communities, but especially I know for a fact here in Austin, were not allowed to publicly swim or swim in public swimming pools. And um, as a result, there's a lot of African Amer Americans who don't know how to swim, but it's because they were literally denied access to public pools. And so um, it's just documenting these youths at the pool, like was just really a way to kind of like appreciate and celebrate um, the fact that Black kids could be safe in a public pool, could be free in a public pool, and could exist without any inhibitions in a public pool. Yeah. Well, the, it does all, all of those emotions definitely are in those photographs, that, that definitely freedom that, the, the again, the human body has. And it's, it's just, those are incredible photographs. So um, thank you. Um, Vera, I want to kind of, I don't know, similar in, in some ways, but thinking about um, another element to your work, these photographs and many of your other, other photographs, there is um, a connection also to personal belongings and, and kind of materials that people have as part of the, um, we've in our conversations over the last few years um thinking about these uh, micro economies that exist within the migrant experience and having been given things or losing things uh, along the way and maybe talk a little bit about that how that interacts with um with that experience and all that kind of comes through in your photographs as well yes so I think uh, very early on when I started photographing migrant caravans in 2017. So this was the year before they became known internationally, which was 2018. Uh, I traveled with them on freight trains, uh, collectively known as La Bestia, the Beast. And um, so I remember being one, one time we were, the train stopped and some some of the folks there they asked me like hey you want a sneakers <laughs> and i thought oh my god yes <laughs> that's my favorite chocolate <laughs> and when i gave it a bite it took me back home so i i understood oh my god home is where they're at and like if you think of food if you've been to other countries you go over there and like, oh, the food might be great, but I, well, that's one of the things that you miss the most, food. And just giving that bite, oh my God. And I just started thinking of home um, when, when I gave it a bite. And so migrants adapt, you know, they try to learn to adapt easily to anything come, that comes their way. Uh, like they'll have a, a backpack with a very basic belongings. And if you think of a backpack, that's all they got to make a living in for the next few days in wherever they're at and to start a new life in a completely different country with a different language. So they, they carry the bare minimum um, of belongings and a backpack is like very, very valuable, very valuable possession to some people carry, you know, their um, religious figures and things like that. Um, yeah, was, yeah. I, I want to want to follow up question with you about about photojournalism, um, but also think about the narratives that are depicted in photojournalism and print and you know, what is your perspective on what the relationship between the press and the audience and the migrant caravans, like how, how do you want people to understand that relationship, like what the press is doing and how they're uh, documenting the uh, migrant journeys? Uh, so I already talked a little bit about this, but one thing that I think that everybody should maybe keep in mind is that 
this photo right here doesn't represent Victor and his daughter. This is just one day. That girl was turning one year old. That was her first birthday and she spent it traveling on this freight train. That That's not who they are. That this, this, is, this is not them. This is just a little fragment in, in their lives. Um, and the, when you look at the news, so keep that in mind that this is not it. That's not all they are. They are parents, they are daughters and you know whatnot. So that there's so much more than being a migrant. What you're looking at is, okay, this is the news. This, this, these are the news, this is what happened. Um, but they also have, we often think of migrants as them wanting things we have, but sometimes <laughs> we want things they have. I, I learned that uh, when I was doing a project about migrants that met at, at a migrant camp and they started dating and I thought, oh my God, you know, I wish I had someone, I, I wish I was dating someone. So that's when I <laughs> understood like, oh my God, you know, sometimes they got things like I, I wish I had. And so to not think of them as often as wanting. Also, what we see on the news is kind of very superficial, you know, just so you have an idea of what's happening. It's not, that's not it. When many of the things that you learn about them and the reasons, the reasons for which they leave, it's, you need to talk to someone, you need to be there in person to more fully understand. I've heard people say, oh, but how can parents send their kids by themselves across the border? Why didn't they stay with them? I can't judge them because I've never been in their situation. And honestly, I don't know what I would do if I was. So I, I think that just to understand that they're doing the best they can. If the best you can do to provide for your kids is to send them across alone. You don't know what those kids would be facing if they stayed in their country or if they stayed at the migrant camp. So I think that we should always take everything with a grain of salt and, and not judge, you know, their, their decision just because us being privileged living in a first world country, we wouldn't do that. It, they live in a very different world. Um, so what you see in the news is not it. It's just a very basic understanding. Um, so there's always more to it. Yeah. So just to um, just one more, you know, point, if either of you want to comment on it, but I feel like what you both do is you do um, certainly show real the realities of different situations, but at the same time, you you both really focus on those moments of joy as well. And those like, um, you know, your photographs are not all about hardship. In many cases, one of the, we did a, a book project a, a few years ago. And one of my favorite photographs of yours in that book is the, is um, uh, the group of women that are playing together, like in the, they're sitting on bunk beds and it's a wonderful, it's just, it's just a great moment and it could be almost anywhere, but um, and so, and, and, and Cindy, I think you do a very similar thing where you, you look for those moments of, of joy, you know, and that is, that is again, what kind of connects and, and it also from a, from a viewer's perspective, right. That's why these, these photographs resonate with people. That's why when people come in and we're sitting here monitoring the gallery, they come up to it. It happened this morning when I was in here, they they just love the photographs because they can instantly connect with them. And so um, I just want you guys to know that that's definitely, uh, I know it's difficult to do, but you're definitely accomplishing that. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. That's a wonderful compliment. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, we're in session two. I'm gonna introduce our two uh, photographers and then we'll start our discussion. So on my far left, Stephanie Dupree Ruth is a freelance photographer based in Austin, Texas, Austin, Texas, excuse me. Her photographs have been exhibited in the U.S. and internationally and collected by major institutions. In 2021, she published her first monograph, Where the Ocean Drinks the Sky, which combines street photography and fine art photography. 
She is a South Texas native who frequently travels around Texas, Mexico, India, and the Mediterranean, often returning to locations to document visible changes in local cultures. Much of her work is based on bodies of water and the way in which residents of these regions interact with their environments. Jamie Robinson, to my immediate left, is a visual artist and educator from Houston, Texas. Jamie is currently a lecturer at Sam Houston State University. She has been the recipient of numerous awards for her work, uh, which has been featured in galleries and festivals internationally. Her work focuses on capturing the history of the African di diaspora present within her current life and childhood, and does, does so by reflecting on Black communities in the South and her extended family's history. Robertson's focus on telling undertold or intentionally omitted stories of African Americans is a feature of her ongoing work. And I also want to say we have extended biographies also on our webpage, so you can also check out and find out more about all of our photographers. So please welcome our next two guests. Okay, so this session, the last session we talked about um, subjects and the and the human body a lot. Um, and I'm, cer I'm certain we'll talk a little bit about that in this, but this session, uh, the conceptual framework for it is I want to think about place. And um, both of your work really does focus, uh, work especially in this exhibition, focus on locations and thinking about place. Um, so um, the depictions of space or locales is evident, evident in your projects in this exhibition. Could you talk a little bit about your process for capturing the essence of a place and the way that you want the viewer to understand it? And so one of the things that we've also talked with students about, you know, are do you intend the viewer to see the place through your eyes? So maybe Stephanie you could start in thinking about the Egypt series in particular. Um, so my process for capturing a place is very fluid. I go to a place and I think that every place has a mood or a feeling and it makes me feel a specific way. <clears throat> so I start out by just documenting for my own personal um, remembrance of the things that I see and the things that I notice. And I try to capture how that place makes me feel. Um, so when I present an image, I think that it's like a doorway that I show you what I see, but I leave the door open. And if I'm good at doing that, then the viewer brings their own experiences and their own expectations to that image and they interpret it in a way that connects with them. Um, not sure if that totally answered your question, but that's kind of what I do. I photograph feelings. That I have. Yeah. And you and you've talked about um also we've in other conversations that you feel like you shoot shoot intuitively. Always. And so that does inform the the yes. way that we see them too. Yes. Is knowing that. I do. I I don't go in with any preconceived notions about what I might photograph or what my narrative might be. I just photograph what moves me um emotionally or mentally and and then later I go back and look at my work and see what threads start to show up and what narrative shows up. And um, and it's it's a very unknown process. I just go with my gut <laughs> and feel it. Jamie, do you want to answer the same question? Sure. Um, so I guess for me, in particular, looking at the charting the Afroscape series, it is it is through my eyes. Um, and my personal connection with this landscape. Um, it, this particular place in Leon County has been in my family for over 130 years plus, maybe 140, 40 years. And so for me, it's, it's about trying to stake claim that you know we existed in this place and that we're still here. Um, it's not, the landscape is not used in the same way that it was, you know, 50 years ago, but it still exists as a place of, of solace, of retreat for my family. Um, and so when I'm approaching making images of this landscape, I'm thinking about, you know, little kind of the future in a way too, because I have a lot of anxiety about what's going to happen with it. You know, there's an image um, 
that actually I think most of the most of the images of the houses are of my great grandmother's house. And so um, it, with the exception of the one at, during the day, um, you know, I, I have a lot of memories going to that house on the weekends and playing in the front yard. And so, you know, a lot of the, the scenes are things that kind of feel like the memory of that place. Um, but, you know, when I'm presenting it to people, I hope that people can get a sense of home and of place and how significant this place is. Um, it's been really great to, to see people respond to it and that, you know, even cross-culturally people can still relate to, you know, a rural environment because, uh, you know, there are a lot of places like that in Texas that people, you know, grew up, they grew up in the rural era, area and then moved to the city. And so having this work reminds them of home um, and also shows that this this is a this is a place that is worth photographing as well that it's not you know something that you leave behind and forget um it's still imp important and relevant to this day well i think um the kitchen sink image i think everyone can relate to it. it's such a beautiful <laughs> photograph the light is extraordinary and then just seeing that you know seeing the landscape outside it is just um i mean i think that's so universal mm -hmm. that everyone can can um can really relate to that. I, I kind of want to continue with the idea of, of landscape and um, Jamie, maybe just, you know, sticking with you. So another part of the work is you know, the evidence of human action in an environment, but also natural beauty. So um, how do you feel your works demonstrate an interaction between people and nature? I think that my work is tr trying to show like a contrast between the two. Um, especially in the images of like my great grandfather's house, where we can see that the house is there, but is obstructed by all of the natural beauty around it. The nature has basically reclaimed this this space, right? The house eventually, you know, when it was well cared for, the area was, you know, manicured and cut down so that, you know, you could see, but now it's everything is coming closing back in on it um, no one's lived in that house for maybe about like 20 years and so this is 20 years of overgrowth um, coming into play here um, with that in contrast to the house my great-grandmother's house where it's perfectly manicured front lawn there's a truck in the front yard the lights are on you know someone's home um, so I think for me the work is trying to show this contrast between there's some places that you know maybe we care more for and then others that or they may feel abandoned, but we still care for them. It's just maybe the resources aren't there to care for them in the same way. Um, so I think it's, you know, like a contrast between the two or this trying to find a balance of walking the line between showing how people are interacting with, with the space. So Stephanie, kind of the same question or similar question, this, this idea of people in the landscape or in, in nature. And of course you have one of the most famous, um, natural features probably in the world the Nile to to work with here well uh, people live on the Nile they swim in it they work on it um, and so having bodies of water or any place for that nature that people are which is everywhere um, it's a great thing to be able to show how how people engage and and I think Vero said, you know, we have so much in common. So no matter where you are, it's very easy to find commonality and see, you know, how people are the same and how they they interact with their environments. And I think it's a a nice way to document that is is just showing either people in the environment or evidence of people in the environment. Can you talk a little bit about the, especially the photograph, the, the one that I have really large on the, on the wall um, with the ripples and uh, the sugar refineries in the background and just talk a little bit about that image in particular. So um, in Egypt, there are many like sugar factories along the river and they pollute basically. And the pollution just floats across the river. And when the sun is, not quite high in the sky, but almost ready to go for sunset, but not quite. It creates this, um, it looks like a sunset, but it's sort of a surreal sci-fi look, if you will. Um, and it just floats across the river. And 
I find it very peaceful and beautiful, even though it's probably a very negative thing. Um, you know, people breathe the particles in the air and you can see them at a distance, but not close, but they are there close. Um, and I find that you can have beauty in something that's also probably not the best uh, for us as a humanity. But this is just also a testament to people who work on the river, work by the river, live at the river. Uh, it's a, it's an integral part of life in Egypt. And, um, and everything centers around when the river's high and when it's low. And that determines what happens, um, whether it's the sugar factories or it's the you know little islands that pop up and they make charcoal or use it for storage or whatever. Um, it's just a, a lifeline, if you will, for people in Egypt. And is that one of your intentions to show that relationship? Or does that come after when you're, you're back home kind of sorting through the images? No, I think it's intentional in that I'm a, I like to say I'm a culture vulture <laughs> and I, I really pay attention to what happens politically, economically, um, when I'm traveling, I want to know what people's lives are about. I want to know how they work. I want to know how they eat, where they live. So these are things that I consciously pay attention to. Um, so when when I made that image of the particles, dust, smog, whatever it is, um, I was thinking about people that work in those factories and people that live on the banks right there, and it just covers their house and their area and so it is definitely conscious on my part in the beginning I'm you know I start with curiosity yeah um Jamie kind of thinking about how you're the way your this project in particular other projects develop mm -hmm. you know where is that um obviously it's something you've known about your whole life mm -hmm. so it's a place that you're intimately familiar with but where does the photography project kind of enter in there and and how does the um the, how do you move that concept forward i guess in some ways can you restate the question well just like you know how does your project develop you know you you knew probably for a long time mm -hmm. that you were going to do a project based on no i this? didn't okay no <laughs> well then please tell us that story. um i you know I started photographing my great grandmother's house really out of just trying to become a better photographer photographer at night um, and really wanting to practice, you know, shooting at night. And, you know, we were there for like some kind of family event. And so I'm out and just shooting. Um, and even like there's the images where we do have people in them. Those are from our family reunion. My intentions were to photograph the reunion for posterity so that my family could have the images. Um, I wasn't thinking that I was gonna maybe, I mean, I thought I was gonna maybe use some of the images that people weren't in, were not in. Um, Cause I was trying to be very careful about, you know, having my family on display um, in, in, in an exhibition in that way. Um, but when, I got to like the end of my the MFA process and I'm looking through everything and they all just kind of fell into place. Like the images, this is like three or four years of photographs put together. Um, you know, me, you know, structuring like little still lives of the Bible and the knife together or going to visit the cemetery. Like this is all over a course of several years. And again, that anxiety about what's going to happen to this place and the fact that I don't get to go there as much as I used to when I was a kid. I was in, When I was a kid, I was there every summer. We spent the entire summer up there and there's nothing to do but play outside or help shell peas or, you know, like all of the like rural things that kids have to do. You just kind of, you know, like you're on a farm basically, right? Um, and so I was feeling like I was starting to lose some of those memories. And I knew that, you know, this is a this is a place that's available to me. This is a place that has a lot of meaning to me. But then when looking it up in any kind of official record, it says that, you know, Egypt community is a ghost town. And that was the the end. Um, and that really that that sentence was the catalyst for me to be like, no, this is not. You know, this was a thriving community. Maybe people don't live here as in, as they used to, but there are still families here and people come back. And they still have, you know, church services on the third Sunday of August, you know, so it's not 
a ghost town. There are people here, right? There was a, there is a history here too as well. Um, so, you know, it really kind of started to form together over the course of three or four years. Um, and that, I want to say that that spring 2020, when I'm like, you, you got to put something in, 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 in the gallery, um, everything just kind of gelled and just came together and it, and it formed into, into a book. Uh, well, that's, I think that's also great. Both of you just kind of great advice too. just like go out there and create mm -hmm. and take pictures and you don't always know where the end of the line is going to be or where or and it's not over right there are all of these things for i think for both of you is it's not it's just one stage in a larger uh project right potentially absolutely so, but st so sticking with you jamie just and you kind of answered this but maybe kind of putting a little finer point um artistically exploring the african diaspora um you know, how do you feel that your personal uh, experience and your family's history, how do you feel like that contributes to a larger national dialogue that's happening? I think that, you know, it's kind of us, I don't know, I think about, I think, tend to think about the African diaspora as these little archipelagos of Black existence throughout the globe, like where are Black people making things, living, creating, and you know, what is it like for them in these, in these different places? And I don't, I wasn't seeing that being represented for East Texas, or at least the, the county that I'm from. Um, and you can, you know, wait around for someone else to do it, or you can, you can do it. Um, and so I decided that, you know, I wanted to share this work with the world, because I felt like, it adds to this greater narrative of Black people in Texas. And then it adds further to the narrative of Black people in the South and then to the United States and then oh, as a whole globally about like Black land, land ownership, right? Um, and even thinking about like, how do people, you know, how do how did Black people live in the 1950s and 60s in this area? Um, my, mom, my mom grew up there, right? And her experience of living there, I, I always heard it growing up my whole life. My grandparents talked about it very openly about, you know, what it was like living, you know, off in this, this community. They were relatively left on their own, um, but they're surrounded by family and extended family. And so I wasn't really seeing a lot of, you know, narratives coming like that out of the, you know, that are even nationally about Black people. It tends to usually focus on a more urban environment, the city, um, but that's a very different you know, even though I grew up in the city, but I also have this rural experience, like I feel kind of caught between two places. And I wasn't really seeing that being represented. And I know that I know that I can't be the only one. I know I'm not the only one. There are lots, there are lots of people who have this, this, this feeling of growing up in between two places. Um, and so for me, you know, this particular body of work is a way to kind of mark that we are here, like that we exist in this space, we have a history in this place. Um, and that is worth knowing. Um, it's not, and it's, you know, not just meant to be like a secret private thing for my family, like our history is worth knowing publicly for, you know, the greater understanding of Black people in the U.S. That's, um, I'm, I'm, that uh, comes, brings to mind uh, some of the conversations the curatorial team had and thinking about the idea of shelter mm -hmm. and what that means and the fact that we can think of community also as a, a form of shelter. Absolutely. And and that is another way that we, looking at all of these photographs, thinking about the need for shelter and the need for community and how those things are, are very strongly connected. Yeah. Um, uh, so Stephanie, I wanna, let's move a little bit more towards water okay. um, and thinking about, um, these works obviously on the Nile, but your larger body of work, you're, you're very drawn to water. Your many of your your book is about water as well. So, um, how do you feel that um, because you've you've gone to so many different places, different bodies of water, how do they influence your work over time? And you go to someplace new, or you go back to the same place? Um, well, I grew up very near the coast in South Texas. And so I was around the water a lot growing up. And when I left, a lot of people from my hometown said, you're going to miss the water. And I said, eh, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm out of here. 
But I found that um, as I move through this world, I'm constantly drawn to water and I'm constantly drawn to situations that are familiar in the sense that um, I went fishing with my grandfather and I spent a lot of time at the beach or on rivers. Um, and so I tend to go back to those places over and over, not only to understand how it's different in other parts of the world and how other people use water in different ways or, or enjoy water in different ways, but also to find myself in those spaces because I think a lot of times when I travel, I'm really looking for how do I fit in this specific spot and how how could I be a part of this particular locale? And so I find that as I keep going back to water-based locations, um, my imagery tends to get a little softer and a little more intimate and a little more personal. Um, the water tends to start showing up in ways that maybe I remember from my childhood or that I remember from other places in the world. And I might um, consciously or subconsciously project what I saw in one country into another country and see if it fits and see if it feels good or not. So I think that's how the water um, influences what I do. And it also gives me a great sense of peace. I feel so relaxed. And so making photographs is very easy near the water for me because it just takes any kind of apprehension away. Um, it feels very connecting for me personally. And the light is very interesting as well. The light is always interesting at the water and under the water too. <laughs> so <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah, we had a diff one of our most difficult choices when we were doing uh, selecting the images was to figure out which which um, sex which series. And you have an incredible series from Mexico and fishing along the water there. Yes. So definitely tell people to go to your website and look Thank at some you. of those photographs because those are extraordinary as well. It was Thank a, you. That was a tough decision um, um, to make for us. And so, but we did want to represent a project because really this exhibition zeroing in on different projects allows um people to understand that the focus and attention that you're each paying to these projects is um there's a uh there's a continuity between the images and there's also a way that it kind of brings people in this case to those places or in the other to where those people are and that's very important um, okay, so um, Jamie, thinking ag again about water, we I also want to mention our uh, the video installation that we have, which is one of uh, a number of projects, video projects that you've done about water. And so maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, and I'll tell our our Zoom viewers to go to your website and see they can see excerpts of your other um, water um, projects. So maybe talk a little bit about those. Yes, absolutely. So um, the video that's playing in the window uh, display um, is called Waters 3, a question. Um, and it was shot in Biloxi, Mississippi, um, at the site where they were, where there was a, a wait-in. And so wait-ins were when people were doing civil rights, you know, they, of course, we've heard of sit-ins, people go to the diner, you sit and you wait to be served or, and, but, you know, a lot of times they were harassed and thrown out. There's a similar thing happened at the beaches along the Gulf Coast. And so, you know, I went to Biloxi on this trip with two other artists. Um, well, we were actually going to Mobile. Um, and we were doing a lot of like historical tours and we were, we were at this place at sunset. And I remember sitting there and thinking about like, how do you even possibly try to segregate water? Something so fluid, right? And something older than we are, right? All of the water that has ever existed and will exist is already on the earth. There's, they're not making new water. It's already been here. It's all, it's, it's, this is all we got, right? Um, you know, so I began thinking about like the history of water and, you know, how, what could it tell us about ourselves? I mean, of course there's the environmental impact, but there's also a way, I think, more spiritual or poetic way to approach it. 
And so that video piece is really a reflection on that question of how do you segregate water and also informing the audience about the weigh-ins because it happened in, in not just in Mississippi, it happened in, in St. Augustine, Florida as well. And I'm sure also in Texas, I'm just maybe need to do a little bit more research, but there were segregated sections of, of beaches that this is where black people can swim or you can, you know, and it's usually the, the worst part of the beach that's like jagged and rocky and nobody wants, you know, you fall, you could hurt yourself kind of area, right? Um, but being in that place and then also seeing the diversity in Biloxi at that time of people who are at the beach in that moment when I was there in 2021, you know, I just really was really baffled by the, the attempt or, you know, to even try and segregate something as fluid as and natural as water. Um, and so, you know, that was this video piece is the the kind of culmination of that reflection. That's great. And I, as I was telling you earlier today, I mean, it's people have just been walking and by it and stopping and watching it. And it's been a really, uh, really nice addition to the, the exhibition. Um, I think we're going to wrap this session up. And so I want to thank both of you again, and I'll see you just in a few minutes and we'll bring our other two photographers up and we'll have a really short two minute break. Okay, welcome back. Um, I want to again thank all of you for participating in this event. It's been great so far. Um, we're going to move to some, um, some questions. So if you're on Zoom and you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat and uh, we'll have them asked to our guests. Um, but I want to start with maybe just a general question that for all of you, which um, we haven't directly uh, touched upon, but we've certainly talked a lot about photojournalism. Um, and I want to think about um, the relationship between photojournalism and fine art photography. And so maybe get your perspectives on that. So I think that both are, it's, it's, I can't separate from one from the other. Because I, I think I consider myself first an artist and then a photojournalist because every time I'm taking a photo, I'm thinking of the elements of design. Mm -hmm. I took I took a art appreciation class early on when I began my career, um, which I changed major several times. But but that's one class that I took online and it really had an effect on me. I'm not even never been a, an art major or anything like that. And of course, I continue studying like other photographers and their work. But every time I take a photo, I'm thinking of balance, um, rhythm and, and all those things. So, no, I, I can't separate them. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to take that difficult question? How do you feel about the two? Yeah, I would say I I would agree. I agree with Beto. Um, art inspires um, my images. Like I'm always thinking about the images that I make artistically, whether it's you know making portraits, documenting um, an event, or documenting a community, whatever have you. Um, I'm always thinking about like how the light is shining, or the framing, or um, Am I noticing symbols? Am I noticing patterns? You know, um, I think, I think the art being the artistic side is always informing the images. Yeah, uh, I tend to agree with that statement, <laughs> with both statements. Um, I think that the only possible difference would be with fine art, you have the liberty of changing a lot of things there are no rules. And with photojournalism, you need to be as honest as a tricky word, but you need to represent what you see without deleting people or specific objects that are important to the image. Um, so I find that if you're a fine art, if you're a fine artist, but not a photojournalist, you can do whatever you want. And it's very liberating. I'm trying my hand at that at the moment. Um, but I do agree that when you're documenting things in the world, people in the world, places in the world, um, you're constantly thinking about the artistic aspects of what your image will ultimately be. And that that's also, I think, very respectful of what you are photographing as well and putting it in its best light. 
um, I guess that to just kind of confer with everyone has said they they definitely are um, related to get like together you can't really separate them and as as I've seen a lot of fine art photographers who will say they dabble in documentary photography and maybe documentary photographers will say they dabble in fine art photography but um, I think both of them are very inherently linked and to you know what Steph what Stephanie was saying about you know the eth ethical parts of it um, with fine art you know you can <laughs> you can push things and be unethical as a way to kind of raise awareness of the ethics maybe um, but if you are reporting on a situation, you know, you have a responsibility to, as you were saying, represent this in, a, in the most ethical way with integrity to the people that you're representing as well. Whereas, you know, fine art, I think you, you some, I mean, I don't know if it's, sometimes it can be good, sometimes it can be bad that people can get away with being unethical. Um, and they'll say that it's, you know, avant-garde or cutting edge that they can do that. Um, I'm kind of on the fence about how <laughs> about how that's done. Um, but I definitely think that the two, um, you know, they're both, of course, photography, the two, you know, genres of photography are closely related and they will always, I think they will always will be. Because I think to be a, a successful photojournalism, you have to have that that art aspect to it, right? The approach to lighting, to composition, all of that, it really matters. So it is in some ways a question of audience too, and the relationship you you have with the audience. And if it's in a newspaper, it's it's somewhere that there's that expectation from them. Whereas if you're walking into an art gallery, it's a very different expectation. So I think that's an important thing to, to think about. Great. Yeah. I just want to say something that I thought of in this moment with that image back there on the back wall with the with the little boy flying. Speaking of um, photojournalism and, you know, the, in, the in integrity and, and ethically uh, speaking, um, wanting to represent a scene in uh, the truest way. Um, sometimes, I, I don't know about y'all, but when I am not out, not, you know, my photojournalism hat is off, right? Um, I still sometimes struggle with like, should I remove this element from this image? Um, I played around with the photo on the back wall. I played around um, with the little boy that's underneath um, the right arm, <laughs> removing him. And I was like, no, I, it just doesn't feel right. But I don't know if y'all have that, you know, that struggle as well. Like when you take off the photojournalism hat, or the photojournalist hat in, want to want to approach your work like just strictly artistically and think about what looks good <laughs> what's not distracting or you know whatever you have to look we've had the fortune the good fortune of being able to look at that image a lot you know because we've been and it takes you a while to see that other figure like you don't even because because the other image is the other figure is so dominant in the, that it you you do it obviously because you're looking at it and you're thinking about it how to present it but it takes a long time to even see that figure because because of the composition is so strong already so yeah it's interesting because we yeah any questions from the audience uh, the photo with the bible and the knife what is the story behind that Uh, so the the photo of the Bible, the knife that that uh, photograph is called Psalm of Protection. Um, that has to do with the story that my mom was telling me about her grandmother growing up and how um, she used to keep a Bible open on the side of her bed with a knife across it. Um, this was also when there would be really bad storms. They would have to go into a little hall closet and they would be, have a Bible with a knife across it. And the Bible is always open to Psalms 91, which is the Psalm of protection. And so I was, no one could explain why she would do this other than, you know, maybe the Bible brings comfort. But as I was learning more about the, you know, the remnants of African culture that are left in African American culture, I was reading more about how the Bible becomes like a, like a symbol of power or talisman and the kind of in the same tradition of like the uh, West Central African talismans and like little like mojo bags and things like that. 
Um, and so I'm relate, I'm trying to recreate this moment in that image through still life. Um, because it's, it's, it's a story that's like seared in my mind. And in every time I go to my grandmother's house, she has Bibles in every room open to do that same, you know, verse. And the pages are like old as dirt and like terrible looking, but you open the rest of the Bible, it's clean because it just stays, it just stays on that one page like for years and it you know it's meant to be like this is the thing that protects the room protects the home so it's me recreating um some of my family's like mythology in in within that image so all of you have some works that are displayed in various forms of media including recorded inter interviews made in conjunction with photo projects original um video projects feature films documentaries printed books highlighting particular uh, photography projects. So how do you maintain your artistic intention and message throughout these different forms of media? You know, so basically the idea is that your works are sometimes in book form, sometimes they're in a gallery, sometimes they're video projects, sometimes they're in a online newspaper or other, other media. And so um, because it's a digital format, right, is another part of the question you don't, um, how does that affect their process, I guess? In the making or in the, in the kind of the way that you want the viewers to have access to it? Well, I had an answer, but I think the question changed. Um, I was going to say that for me, I firmly believe that at some point in time as an artist, you find your own demeanor, you find your own voice, which a lot of people talk about voice. And I find that whatever I do, the essence of who I am as an artist comes through, regardless of the medium that it is presented in. And whatever medium is used, is just a different tool to push the work out so that more people can see it and enjoy and interact with it. Um, I just think that it's the world is a much bigger place than one person. And, and the more channels you can use to push your work out is a, a fantastic tool. Great. Anyone else want to talk about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll say that you know, initially when I started exper experimenting with um, other other media forms, it began as a way to kind of assist with the visual storytelling and the image. So, um, you know, if I'm documenting a community through portraits, I might want to interview them, you know? Um, as a way to like really give more um to give more history give more background and to give more you know set the kind of sort of the stage for the the visual element um and that's initially how it began but um there was something that you said that I wanted to speak to but I completely forgot so I will pass the mic <laughs> And if it comes back, if I think about it, you know, I'll say it. Um, I think for me, because the Charting the Afroscape series really came together first as a book, um, it has been really interesting to see how, you know, presenting it as an exhibition versus a book um, differs. In the book, I had so much space. Um, I had like maybe over 23 images in, in the book accompanied by like family archival photographs as well. And sometimes that's, that doesn't always get to be in the exhibition space with the work. Um, especially, you know, if you're, you know, depending on, you know, physical space of the gallery and like what else is happening. Um, the book, I think, gave me the, the, you know, the breathing room to kind of sort through all these images and to tell the story um, and to really organize these images from, you know, Within a, within a framework that was, you know, made sense to me in which I was talking about life cycles. Um, so moving from night to day, um, you really get a sense of that in the book more, I think, 
than you, I mean, you still do in, in the exhibitions, but in the book, because there's more images that that's kind of built over time as you're flipping through the pages versus, you know, in the exhibition, you're standing, looking at the wall and everything's presented to you at once. And you kind of, you know, maybe go up to the images one at a time and kind of take them in. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're, they're different experiences, but I think that, I don't know, both of them were very necessary for me because I think, you know, books are great when they're portable and, you know, people can have them at, at their homes, but having an exhibition that's out in, in a space that's promoted, it also furthers this, you know, my, my agenda of, <laughs> of, you know, making sure people don't forget about this community um, and marking this place as I, as I've stated before. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, having multiple outputs for the work makes for more accessibility and ultimately widens your audience as, as everyone's been saying. Um, I forget to write one thing about the person that asked about the, how long I stay with them. So I, I learned from the first two, ca two caravans that I was kind of all over the place, which is fine too. But then the third time I focus in one group. And because I focus in one group, I was able to create way more intimate photos. Uh, but that comes with time as well, and like them trusting you. And in regards to to uh, the last question, I'm I'm gonna say two things. So first, speaking just from the technical point of view, sometimes um, a story makes more sense if you do video, and sometimes photos are better. Period. Uh, the second thing I want to add is that I, well, I don't have a book yet, but eventually I'll have a book, uh, is that you might have a website for your project, but then um, maybe for you buy the domain for 10 years, the domain name, 20 years, maybe 30 years, you die, and then where's that work? You know, it's, it won't be available anymore. So I think that's when like books are so important, even though I think maybe they'll become obsolete at some point. I don't know. Maybe they'll live in Kindles and things like that. But having a book is so important because how are people going to look at like the important work, like your family's photos? Like, you know, not, there are not a lot of people photographing their families and their traditions and what they did. So that's oh, like so important um, besides just your family looking at it, like for other people to see it. So I think that's why books are very important. Yeah, I mean, that and exhibitions, they come and go too. As great as they are, and we get to enjoy and we get to be surrounded by the work, they're always limited, which is also important too. You know, it's the, you, that you can experience it and it has, its, it has its life cycle, whereas a book is more permanent, especially if it's in a library and then it can have a long, that's, that's the, a really long life that a book can also have if it's in a collection. We have one more question from Zoom uh, from Dr. Cryu Williams, who is director of the Truth uh, Racial Healing and Transformation Center here at ACC. So small shout out to him. But he says, I think this has been touched on. A photograph represents a moment, not the subject's whole lives. But is there ever a struggle between not utilizing an image that you feel would be embarrassing to individuals? I think that uh, it depends. So I photographed this young girl that almost drowned in the in the river. She was bathing. And sometimes you have to photograph reality. Uh, and, and that's what happened. And it was important for people to know that that happened. After that photo uh, and after that happened, you know, um, the organizations gathered together and they put showers in the migrant camp. It was a really, really small change. Maybe they're very, very micro, but it, it did make a change to know that that happened to also see the images. So sometimes, yeah, you have to do that. And um, yeah, I guess it all depends on the situation. Yeah, I, I think I would agree, especially in, in the situation like that, because it can really affect change. For, for the conditions for people coming um, after that happened. Um, for me, for that my series, I was photographing my family reunion and there's definitely some images where I'm like, I maybe shouldn't put this picture of my uncle with all of these like bottles on his truck, you know? Um, 
maybe like that's not we'll just you know so I it, so there is you know some editing of wanting to kind of I don't know not want to promote like a, a negative image but even though but I struggle with it because you know some of that is that is the reality right like people go to the reunion they they're there all day all weekend people have drinks some people have maybe more to drink <laughs> you know they're having a good time um and so I, you know, I, I took those photographs. I still have them. Will they ever see the light of day? I don't, I don't know. Um, but it is, it is a struggle sometimes. And, you know, in my case, it, it would be, I think more because I, it would be more, I think, embarrassing for my uncle to have that image floating around versus, you know, with your situation like that actually improves prove situations for people. Um, so I, I think it also is like, if it's personal or if it's, you know, you're photographing to bring awareness to a situation like that, that makes a big difference as to why, you know, why you should take photographs of certain things than others. But it's also about, and there's a difference between taking the photograph and then putting it out there. Yes. And that's, so that's not something you always have to think about yes. while you're taking photographs. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would just say as a side note, there are some photographs that you make that are beautiful and you fall in love with that photograph. And then that person says, you can't put that out there. I, I refuse. I don't want it out there. And so there are photographs I'm sure that we all have that we've made that are just stunning in some way or another that no one will ever see because out of respect for the person that's in the image. In my experience, sometimes it's been making a decision around, um, you know, as a queer person who's, you know, in queer communities often and, um, you know, documenting uh, other queer people. Um, sometimes you may have a photo of someone um, in a way that they are no longer presenting. And so um, that is like one of the examples that I can think of that I've been faced with. Um, and, you know, you just have to respectfully, like as no matter how beautiful the image is or how much you love the image, um, you know, at the end of the day, I wouldn't make the decision um, to display the image, um, at least without, talking to the person first. So what piece of advice would you give to young artists and photography students? Experiment um, with all different forms of art. If you're interested in something, uh, figure out who you can connect with or talk to, to learn more about it, to play around more with whatever the, the form of art is um, and to grow, invest in your interests. It's okay to invest in your interests. Um, I went to undergraduate and came out with a business degree, right? Um, <laughs> and I have regretted it every day since. <laughs> um, I didn't know that it was okay to um, really invest in what brought me joy and um, what was actually of interest of me to me. Um, and so that would be my advice whether it's, you know, you're signing, you're paying for a workshop or you're paying for a class or you're, you know, whatever it is, invest in your interests um, and don't be afraid to experiment and grow. And I would say, um, do what makes you happy. Don't follow trends and don't do, I mean, if you have to do a photo shoot and it's a paying photo shoot, for example, to pay bills, of course you have to do this, but your number one priority, I think as an artist is to do what makes you happy. And if you do that, it becomes a universal thing. Um, trends come and go, but your happiness is super important. So follow it. I would tell students, I think I have two two things um to brace uncertainty you don't have to know all the steps of how you're going to get somewhere you just have to take one step at a time um and then also to read more read anything everything science fiction 
you know, scholarly articles, all of those things um, are really, you know, they feed your mind and they end up, you know, influencing the way that you work and, and create things. And so I would definitely encourage people to read more, um, which I mean, should be, you know, we're, you're in college, it should be a given, but I, I teach and I know our art students in college don't want to read. <laughs> they don't want to read. They don't want to read anything. Books um, on tape. Books, you know, even a book on tape. Yes, there's there's Audible, something. <laughs> but definitely, you know, engaging with other mediums like literature, go see a play. Like all of those things can help influence how you're going to make things, how you approach your own style, and vo in creating your your voice as a, as an artist. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna give, I guess, advice as if you're a photographer, maybe, uh, not, not so generally speaking about artists. Uh, yes, like try, like Cindy said, like try every kind of maybe photography, because I tried many, I did nature, um, I just didn't do sports, but every now and then I'll get an assignment where you're doing a little bit of sports. Um, but yes, try uh, everything and also look at other kinds of artwork like uh, sculpture, paintings, and, and look at that. Also, I, I used to love to watch like Mad Men, the TV show. I love the photography there. So sometimes I would just pause the show and then take a picture of the frame and it, because I just loved it so much and, and then try to deconstruct the image. And, and think, okay, why did I like this image? What elements were there? And I would also do that with um, famous photographers, just looking at their work and try to see everything in the frame, like, oh, what I like the most and, and this and that. Wonderful. Okay, so it's explore, it's do what you like, it's read, and it's uh, look look at so many different things, right? I just want to, again, thank all of our guests for sharing their work with us and for uh, coming here tonight and giving us this really great event. Thank you. Thank you.